Hello, and welcome to today's installment of Three Things About a World Quilt. I am Marn Hansen, Curator of International Collections at the International Quilt Museum. Our museum is located at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and like museums all over the United States, we're currently closed to the public. But I want to share some of our collection with you, pieces from all over the world. During this time of social distancing, self-quarantining, and area lockdowns, I think looking at and talking about art and folk art can help us feel closer. Stay tuned as each day this week, I bring you a quick introduction to a new world quilt. So let's take a look at today's object. It is this long, uh, narrow, flat textile from the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Cuba people, probably uh, first half of the 20th century. The first thing I want to tell you about these long flat panels is that they are actually skirt panels. The Cuba people wear these skirt panels. They wear multiples of them. So in this photo of two women, you can see that they are layered. Uh, they have many skirt panels wrapped around them. They also have belts, bracelets, necklaces, anklets. So the skirt panels form a component of a larger ensemble that Cuba people would wear. Now, these skirt panels are no longer worn on a daily basis for the most part in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Like uh, national dress all over the world, uh, many people do no longer wear that form of natural, national dress, but it's worn at special occasions, dance ceremonies, things like that. Now it's not only women who wear uh, these panels. This gentleman, he's a, an official, uh, he, with his two wives, he is wearing skirt panels as well. So these are um, gender neutral. They're worn by uh, all members of society, by men and women. And something important to know about them is that they are, or traditionally were, a sign of status. Here is a local king, a Cuba king, wearing these skirt panels, surrounded by his family or, or court members who are also wearing raffia cloth skirt panels. And they are a, san, a, a sign of status. The more of these you had access to, uh, the more, um, more wealth you had, the, uh, the greater your status within your community or your society. And so they come in many different styles. Here are three examples from our collection. So the more you had of these, or the more you had access to, uh, the more your, um, the more you were seen to have, have status within your society. And even at death, people were expected to be buried with some of these skirt panels. Um, you didn't, people felt you were not able to go to the next world um, without having these precious textiles with you at burial. Uh, they are so embedded within Cuba society, especially traditionally so embedded in society. They were uh, seen as a form of currency. Uh, you could use them in trade. And, but even though they have this value, intrinsic value to them, they also were seen as community objects, a, a community form of material culture. There was sort of a collective responsibility or, or a collective ownership of these because so many people within Cuba society were involved in their creation from the weavers to the embroiderers to the wearers. Um, so there, I think there's, there was, in the West, we tend to think of material culture or, or of objects as very much individually owned. And I think in Cuba society, they were seen uh, more collectively than we are used to thinking about. As I said, these panels or raffia cloth in general was seen as a form of currency, uh, which was then replaced in many ways by cowrie shells. Cowrie shells became a form of currency as well. And so it's interesting to see some of these skirt panels embellished with cowrie shells. The third thing I wanted to tell you about is the two main styles of these Cuba skirt panels. On the left, you see an embroidered uh, cut pile form and on the right you see an appliqued and pieced form. So the cut pile uh, kuba cloth is done as I said with embroidery um, and that embroidery is done in uh, a pattern. There are patterns that are passed down through generations and patterns can have different meanings based on their, their the intended function of a, of a skirt panel or of a cloth. 
Um, but women also felt free to improvise on those patterns. So they might deviate from the pattern they originally started with, as you can see in this cut pile version of raffia cloth on the left. And on the right is a pieced and appliqued version. Now, I said, uh, as I said, they're all raffia cloth, which is made from the raffia palm, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with. And the weaving was pretty much exclusively done by men. So here's a man at a loom weaving the raffia cloth into a usually about a, a one meter square piece of cloth that could then be embellished, pieced together, cut apart to make applique, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And here are two women performing the actual embroidery uh, that is used to make the cut pile form of Kuba raffia skirt panels. And an interesting aspect of this piece that I showed you at the very beginning is that it has cotton, woven cotton cloth borders added to it, which at first glance appear to be pieced. So they look like squares of blue and white fabric pieced together to create a checkerboard. But they're actually long, thin strips of blue and white fabric that are then woven together, which is interesting. It's a technique. Uh, we have not seen before. So hopefully you can see from these photos how they're not actually pieced as squares, but they are woven up and down over each other to create a woven border. Now I'll just close by um, talking about the fact that you may have noticed that this week uh, during three things about a world quilt, I haven't always been showing something that we would technically define as a quilt. So we think about quilts as having three layers and a quilting stitch that holds those layers together. And quilts often also feature techniques of piecing or patchwork and applique. So as we build our international collection, we include examples of pie piecing and applique, even if a piece or an object doesn't have the quilting stitch to it, even if it isn't layered in the way we think in the West or in the United States about quilts. So this Kuba panel has both piecing and applique, and we want to be able to show those techniques as they exist around the world. So that's why some of the objects you have seen this week might not technically um, be considered a quilt, but they are still related and something that we include in our collection plan at the International Quilt Museum. So thanks for joining today, and I will see you next time.